Altruism demands that we show respect, that we sacrifice ourselves for the sake of whom? The weak, the pathetic, those who don't have anything, those who are struggling, those who are in distress. Our moral obligation is to treat them with respect. Our moral obligation is to sacrifice for them. It's to and of all the people out there right now who's being killed left and right and suffering and poor. I mean, the poorest region in the world is the Middle East. Or close to it, sub-Saharan Africa. The pockets that might be poor. But it's the same, same thing. Right? These are the poor of the world. These are the pathetic. These are the miserable. You can't stand up to them. That would be immoral. So there are two sides of this. So one is, the, is that, and, I, and I'll, give you, I'll give you a great example of this from this, that region of the world. What was Europe's attitude to Israel pre-1967? They loved Israel. They loved Israel. All the weapons Israel had when it fought the Six-Day War in 67 were European. They mirage planes, British tanks, German weaponry. Indeed, Americans don't know this, but from 1948 until 1967, there was an arms embargo in the United States on Israel. Not a single weapon was sold to Israel. Right. Placed there by, by uh, the um, Truman administration. Thank you. So, they love, so why did they love Israel? Underdog is such a nice way of saying it. Right? Right, in football, you back the underdog. No, these were pathetic, miserable, poor Jews who had just been slaughtered in the Holocaust and they went a God-forsaken country in the desert and they were pathetic. So we love them. And what happened in, six, in the Six-Day War? These pathetic Jews turned out to be strong, capable, able. They beat five Arab armies in six days, wiped them out. Now we hate them. Because they're successful, because they're proud, because they're able. This is altruism. So Europe immediately, France, embargo of arms on Israel. We hate Israel, right? And who did they start loving? Well, they looked around the world, or that region, and said, who's pathetic? Who's really miserable? Who's suffering? Ah, Palestinians. Great, we now love Palestinians, hate Israelis. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, it happened on a day, on the day the Six Day War ended. Everything flipped. Because you can't support strength. There's no morality in pride and strength and in self assertion. That's deemed the same morality of altruism says you have to sacrifice for the poor, you have to respect them, you have to be good to them, you have to do all this stuff. And at the same time, what do, how do you treat, treat self assertion and pride and, power and strength? Ooh, suspicious. We don't like them. That's too self-interested. So this is, the, this is morality playing out on a global scale. And if you mix that up with religion, wow, powerful. Powerful stuff, right? So we, don't, we can't be self-assertive. We can't be strong because that's wrong. We can't condemn somebody who's weak because that's wrong. So here we are, appeasing killing our own kids, right, to bring them democracy. No, but when you were speaking of Israel and, and, and the Holocaust and the Jews, and I don't disagree with any of it, uh, but I would like to know how you could maybe put into this, uh, can't put it in the picture you've drawn so far, but um, how does the Balfour Declaration fit in <laughs> when we talk about bringing all the folks back to Israel then. And, and what are they, what is Israel, what is the whole point of, of uh, Lord Rothschild and, and Balfour in that circumstance? How did that break up? <laughs> That's a big question. And it's mainly history. Look, the, the, the Balfour Declaration was a deal cut. Um, the British owed... Um, I'm too old for this because I can't remember people's names anymore. Um, the first president of the state of Israel who, who, was, who was in Britain. And it, basically, look, 
No, no, Ben Gurion. He was the first prime minister. Anyway, the po let me try to get to the heart of what I think you're asking, although I'm not sure. It sounds conspiratorial, so I'm not sure. The, the point is this. Jews in the early part of the 20th century in Europe realized something that sounded nuts at the time, but turned out to be unbelievably true. They realized that if they stayed in Europe, they would die. They would be murdered in mass. And, the, and the, the person to really realize this was Theodor Herzl after the Dreyfus trial in France. He was a secular, assimilated Jew who didn't want to be Jewish. Right? He, was, he was completely assimilated. And he looked at Dreyfus, who was a, I don't know how much you know about Dreyfus. Now I'm not going to give you a whole history lesson, but a, a French Jewish general or, or colonel, uh, a very senior a French officer, being persecuted clearly for being Jewish, even though he's completely assimilated. And Herzl came to the conclusion, if this is what's happening in France in those days, the symbol of enlightenment, Europe was, Jews were going to be slaughtered. Anti-Semitism was always going to be around and they would be killed. And he said, what can we do to save ourselves? And he said, the only thing to do is self-identify as a Jew and get all the Jews together and go find a place to live. And Herzl didn't care where. Uh, the British offered uh, the Jews Uganda. And there was a vote in the Zionist Congress. There was a vote. And Herzl voted for going to Uganda. He didn't care. He just wanted out of Europe because he understood what was going on. The Balfour Declaration was a negotiation where the Jews said, look, we're looking for a place of land where there are not a lot of people where we can inhabit. Hey, by the way, our ancestral land is, is now called Palestine. We'd like to go there. So they kind of deal with the British. Now that you've taken it over from the Ottoman Empire, would you give us that land? The British said, sure, we'll bring a little bit of Western civilization part of the colonial project, to the Middle East. Why not? And that's the Balfour Declaration. That's, that's what it is. Uh, the Jews then went, built something, and created something, and they created civilization where there was nothing. You should read Mark Twain sometime on the state of Palestine when he toured it. He's got a little book about his tours around that region of the world, and he has a, has a whole section on Palestine. And there was, there was nothing there. Right? And the Jews built something. They created something. And that's the right that the Jews have to that piece of land. They built it. They created it. They, 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 they created a free country, a civilized country. And that's, that's what needs protecting. Not the Jewishness and not the holiness of the land, but the fact that these people built, created. It's theirs, property rights. Drug is against. I'd like to know your opinion on the United States' foreign policy and what is happening in the Middle East right now. Uh, Right now, I'm not sure we know what's happening. I think the, the United States foreign policy has been disgraceful for years, for decades. I would say roughly since the New Deal, and in part even before that. But if you mean whose side should one be on, Israel or the Arabs, I would certainly say Israel because, because it's the advanced technological, civilized country amidst a group of almost totally primitive savages who have not changed for years and who are racist and who resent Israel because it's bringing industry and intelligence and modern technology into their stagnation. And the philosophy of objectivism. That's right. I just have one point that I think should be made, Ms. Rand, with time fleeting here. I'm, your characterization of uh, the situation in the Middle East came down rather gratuitously and in a, in a very uh, angry way on the Arabs and without discussing the merits of either side in a most complicated and painful collision of cultures and peoples in our, in our world. Why can't why couldn't the, uh, the men, the millions of men, women, and children who are Arab and who find themselves in this desperate conflict and look around wondering when, where peace will be, why can't they be angry with you for your characterization of them, your, your slap at them, your roundhouse <laughs> criticism of them, when you don't seem to be able to tolerate a questioner who suggests that she disagrees with you? <laughs> characterization is... You do not accept any, any criticism unless you level it. No. I don't resort to terrorism 
I don't go around murdering my opponents, innocent women and children. That is what I have against the Arabs. That takes the conflict out of the uh, sphere of civilized co conflict and makes it murderous. And anyone, private citizens, who resort to force is a monster. And that's what makes me Ms. condemn Rand and despise them.